Welcome to the first ever episode of At the Table with Patrick Lincioni. I'm sitting here in the conference room of the Table Group in Lafayette, California. I'm Pat Lincioni, and I'm joined by my partner, the producer and colleague, Cody Thompson. How are you doing today, Cody? Doing great, Pat. Excited to get this podcast going. Me too. This is going to be fun. So tell us what our first topic is, Cody. Today, we're going to talk about why being smart is overrated. Which we really believe it is. Totally. But before we jump in, I wanted to get a little bit of context for our, for our listeners. So Fire away. A lot of people know you from books like The Advantage or The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, but not a lot of people know about the table group and the work that we do. So tell us a little bit about that. We at the Table Group are committed to helping leaders make their organizations more effective and healthy, and in doing so, helping employees find more fulfillment in their work. But what we really do is what we're going to talk about today, and that's help organizations get healthier, make teams work better, make sure that organizations are effective and good places to be. Great. And that's why this is the perfect topic for us to start on, because this is sort of the foundation for what we do. So let's dive into the content. So the topic being being smart is overrated. Tell me what is the difference when we talk about smart? We also contrast it with what we do, which is organizational health. Tell us about smart and healthy. Yeah, being smart is important. No doubt about it. A smart organization is one that's good at the technical things in business. The decision science is like like strategy and marketing and technology and finance, all those kind of things, really important stuff. But there's another side of the equation that you have to have to have a really successful organization, and that's what we call healthy. And a healthy organization is one that has minimal politics and confusion, really high degrees of morale and productivity. People are psyched to be there and they get a lot done. And very low turnover among good people. Great people don't wanna leave a healthy organization. And let me tell you, Cody, whenever I explain healthy versus smart to, to leaders, CEOs, they always say, man, I'd give my left leg to make my organization healthier. But then they realize it's a little messy, it's a little emotional, right. kind of uncomfortable, and sometimes they back off. Yeah. And so, t so that's the whole premise of our company. But where did this come from? Go back to the beginning. Tell us a little bit more about the origin story of all this. Right. Well, I got out of college and I came from a family. I grew up in Bakersfield. My mom and dad didn't go to college. And so I wasn't, I didn't have great internships or understand business or anything, but somehow by a, a bad interviewing process, <laughs> a management consulting firm called Bain and Company hired me. And I was just out of my element. These were some really smart people with lots of experience. And I was just lost. But I was learning as fast as I could. But something didn't seem right to me. It seemed like there was something missing. Everything was about smart, technical knowledge, strategy, finance. And I finally figured it out one day when I went to a client here in the Bay Area, a, fi a big financial services company that everybody listening knows about. So I was a junior consultant. So they had chartered me to go into a conference room and spend three days doing financial analysis to figure out how people purchase things using checks and credit cards and cash. You don't know what checks are coded. Well, yeah, this is a really old financial yes, analysis. Yes. Yeah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and, and after three weeks of doing that work, we went down to the client to present it. I was all excited. And after the presentation, it was very clear they weren't planning on using my data for anything other than competing against another department within their own company to prove that they were more important. Hmm. And I remember after I was kind of crestfallen and I went to the partner on the case and I said, why don't we help them deal with the political issues they have, these interpersonal human issues? Right. And she said, we don't get paid for that here. And I remember thinking, well, that's what I wanna do. And that's really where this started. Fast forward about seven years later and we launched the table group because we realized that there were tons of really smart companies out there that were so unhealthy and dysfunctional, and we wanted to help them address that. That's great, and tell us about the name, the name of the table group, right. how that connects. Well, you know, in spite of all of the scientific advancements in the last 50 years, we are still convinced that the table is the best piece of technology that there is. That things get done when people sit down around a table, look at each other, and get things done. And so we decided to make it about that. A table is still simple, it's sturdy, it's useful, and that's what we're about. Great. And that's why we name this at the table. We want to invite people to our table to talk about what organizational health looks like in the workplace and leadership and some other things that we're going to bring into the conversation. It's the perfect format for a podcast and a conversation like this. Right. And we're going to be joined by various people that come into the office and, and wander in because we want to make this as informal and useful as possible. Yeah. And one of the things that we're going to do at almost every podcast is talk, talk about some stories that help illustrate what we're talking about. Yeah. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of what smart and healthy is or how you create a healthy organization, let's share some stories. I'd love to hear some stories about CEOs as you're going 
going in, presenting the case for organizational health, how are they responding? Well, uh, first of all, it, the, the, it makes sense to them because they know that dysfunction and confusion and morale problems are crippling their ability to succeed. And so very few CEOs will say, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because we started this company 22 years ago, and we were just cold calling CEOs and saying, we can help you with this. And we had to explain to them, it's not touchy-feely. There's nothing soft about this. We're not going to go hug each other and get naked and hold hands or catch each other falling (laughs) out of a tree. This is just as impactful on your bottom line. And so the examples we'd like to use, one of our clients, although they were good at this long before they ever met us, was Southwest Airlines. Hmm. And they're just, it's an amazing story of organizational health. If you don't know anything about Southwest, people assume they're just smarter than all the other airlines. And it's just not true. They don't hire from better schools. They don't have more experience in the industry. They have a culture, which is at the heart of a healthy organization, that, that makes everything else possible. And when you look at why they have never failed to make money, and why they've never had a layoff since they were founded in 1969. It's not because of technical decisions they've made, it's because they've created a culture where people work together and the decisions they end up making making are better. Right, and not to oversimplify, but there's just that they pay attention to the human element, not just the, the smart side of the equation. It's all about the human element. And yet, a lot of writers and, and analysts in business schools have a hard time capturing that, so they wanna, they're really looking for more technical reasons, more intellectual reasons why a company succeeds. They want a silver bullet or something that makes for a great article. The fact is, what makes Southwest great is the human side. Right. Hey, we got somebody who walked into the room. Our first <laughs> informal uh, podcast. Just join in, Chris. <laughs> that's right. We've got uh, Chris Jensen, one of our consultants who lives in Portland, who's not usually here, so he's going to sit down and join us. Hey, jump in on anything you want to talk about. We're talking about organizational health, healthy oh, yeah. versus smart. The topic is why being smart is overrated. Oh yeah. Right. You, you agree? You live this stuff every day with clients, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think this is intelligence is the modern day commodity. You can go purchase this off at any university, but getting people to actually interact well with one another, that's the game changer. Yeah, you raise a great point, Chris, and that's that, that in this day and age, more than ever, intelligence, knowledge is is something that everybody has. It's no longer a differentiator. Right. With the ubiquity of information and the internet, anybody can get information. You, you can't really protect a, an advantage in a business by just knowing something. Right. It's all about creating a culture that taps into that. And here's the great thing. Healthy companies get smarter over time. Smart companies that are unhealthy don't get smarter or healthier over time. And what's interesting is there's actually a mechanical reason why that happens why healthy companies get smarter over time, because the flow of information goes so much smoother. But we don't think of it that way, because it feels like it's a little bit touchy-feely when you start saying, let's be healthy as a company. Right, right, that right. starts to feel very esoteric, and but like, we're gonna start doing- you have less confusion, less politics, really good channels of communication, it's just an obvious- You make exactly. better decisions. Exactly. You actually make better decisions. And you, and you please your customers more, right. and you make them loyal, and you make more money. I mean, it's, is it any surprise that the healthiest airline, Southwest, it makes great money and our customers love them. I, I, I say the same thing in the fast food business or in the quick service business. In-N-Out Burger and Chick-fil-A are both head and shoulders in terms of customer loyalty. And, and Chick-fil-A, they make more money than any fast food business imaginable. And they're closed on the second busiest day of the week. And if you ask the people at Chick-fil-A, and we've worked with them, why, what the secret is, they'll tell you the culture of the company. That's right. The That's health of their sense. organization is more important than anything else. And everybody feels it. I mean, it's customers feel it. People who've never even been there feel it from customers. I mean, when you are around a healthy organization, it's not even just a, there's something around being around health that's just pure attractive. Yep. And there's just something about health that is just magnetizing. Yeah. And it just makes you want to be around it. So whether it's, you know, personal health or family health or organizational health, it's the same principle holds true. Yeah, you know, just the other day I was with a client, a a really neat company, an institution uh, this client was, they've been around for over 100 years, you know who they are, Hmm. but they've been struggling for 10 or 15 years. I mean, really struggling. They've been purchased and sold and purchased and sold and morale was terrible and their bottom line looked terrible. So they brought in a new CEO and he assumed that the problem was they were just not smart. They had no good products ideas, right? So he went in and he finally went and visited the the lab where, I mean, not finally, but in the first few days, he went to the, the new product development lab. Right. And he thought it was the, the cupboards were gonna be bare. And he went in there and he was like, this is amazing. 
they had all these great product ideas, really bright people coming up with new ideas. He goes, how come we're not bringing any of these things to market? And the, the guy running the lab said, because it's so dysfunctional, nobody even asks mm. us. Things don't, good ideas don't make it to Oh, them. I, one of the first times I ever got on the phone with a client, the CEO, I get on the phone with her and she says, hold on a second, I need to close the door. And this is a cancer research organization. How many of us have somebody who's been touched by cancer in our right, life? Sure. This is a company that's dedicated their entire history saving lives. to saving lives. So this has got to be one of the most important the organizations. High, the stakes right? are high. Yeah. And she's like, I need to close the door. If anybody hears me talking to you about the fact that our executive team doesn't trust each other and they don't actually, they're actually competing for who's right, whose oh. research is going to be in the next journal. And I'm thinking, this is tragic. This is mm. not just an organization's ineffective. This is actually tragic for the entire country that this organization, right. this company should be effective because of its impact. You know what show I finished watching last night was Chernobyl. Oh. And that's a, it's a documentary on HBO. And it's, it's no, it's not a documentary. It's a, it's a drama, but it's like a documentary. And they really, the attention to detail was incredible. And one of the things I noticed, I couldn't help it in the very last episode. I won't, no spoiler alerts here. People know what Chernobyl is, but they were, they were talking about the root causes. Yeah. And it, they were talking about the technology of nuclear fission and all this other fusion and all this other stuff. But the, the human dynamics that allowed that to happen were amazing. People mm -hmm. weren't listening to each other. They weren't having conflict. Part of it was the Soviet system where you, you weren't allowed to tell the truth. But part of it was as human beings that wouldn't say no. Right. And it was so, and some people tried to, but they weren't listening. And you just think of the cost exactly. of, of unhealthy organizations. It's hard not to admit that that's, a massive impact on success, people's enjoyment Absolutely. of their jobs. And it goes back to what you said at the very beginning, which is that it, almost never have you walked out of a room and thought this group of people is not smart enough to nope. be successful. 22 right? years. It almost always is a downstream symptom of the fact that they have politics and confusion and they're, they don't trust each other. And so that's really, when we talk about the human element, it's not some touchy filler, feely cultural element to it. Oh, yeah. this, this cancer research organization, brilliant people. I'm every sure. single person around in the company, multiple PhDs. I mean, this is, this is literally the most brilliant people ever. And in fact, one of the guys on the executive team, his only job is to stay connected to the top 25 cancer researchers in the world. I mean, these are brilliant, but totally losing funding, getting demolished because of the internal politics. I and mean, it's, it's worth repeating what you just said, Cody. I've never in 22 years gone into a company and said, these people don't know their business well, well that's enough. That's right. Mm -hmm. They always have more than enough intelligence to be wildly successful. It's the human element, which is not soft. Right. No. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had talked about right before I came on the podcast as we were discussing stories, my own personal story of having worked at a company prior to the table group. Right. And I told you this in the interview, and I think you hired me out of sympathy or yeah, empathy or one of the sadness. two. But I had previously worked at a super sophisticated company here in, in the Bay area startup. There were only five or six people when I, when idea, I started though. there. Hmm. Co-founders, extremely intelligent, big data guys, like used, you know, statistics to make all the decisions. And but when it came to the human element, it was, it, there was a, a story I shared with Pat that it was a startup with only six people. We worked at a kitchen table in a rented apartment. We're sitting across from the, each other at the table working on our laptops. And I'm getting instant messages from one of the co-founders from the sitting across from me about my performance and st strategy and direction of the company. And, and I, his performance. And, yeah, right. with his performance. <laughs> and my performance. <laughs> and I, and I type back, Hey, do you want to go into the spare bedroom or maybe into the hallway and we can have a conversation? And he simply replied, no. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's needless to say, I, I don't work there anymore. I don't. And this I, was a company with an idea that should have gone crazy. Right. And, and they were taken off. relatively successful, but not nearly as successful oh. as they could have been if they would have fixed that, if they would have focused even a little bit of attention on the human element. Okay, this is a good point. And it's a, we're right here in the heart of the Silicon Valley, right in the Bay Area. How many companies oh. are started with brilliant ideas that actually should be successful? There's yeah. no reason they oh, shouldn't yeah. be. But oh, yeah. we know, having been around some of them, how many of them are completely irrelevant and gone just because founders couldn't get along or they started right. to grow and they couldn't get their people to work together. They were growing too fast and everything is being pushed, pushed, pushed. And what the, the pressure is only accentuating the fact that their people don't actually know how to work together. Absolutely. Yes. And, and technology and finance are probably two of the industries Biggest that drivers. struggle with this the most because they think all we need is the, the most intelligent engineers. 
Yeah. It's like, no, you have to create a culture where you tap into that. Again, health is the great multiplier of intelligence. The healthier you are, the more you get to use it. And Pat, I want to jump in here because we've told some stories and we've talked about the downstream, downstream symptoms of these things, but we let's put some handles on this for the listeners. So what is it that a healthy company does? Let me go real fast here. There's four things that a healthy organization does. And I'm always tempted to go into too much detail and I won't. First, they they make sure that the team at the top, whether it's the CEO and his or her direct reports, the pastor and that team, the principal and that team, or the head of a department and that team, the, the team that's leading the organization has to be behaviorally cohesive. That's what I talk about in the five dysfunctions of a team. But they also have to be intellectually aligned. They have to create clarity. There's six simple questions that they have to all be on exactly the same page about. They cannot afford to be on different pages. So they have to have behavioral alignment, intellectual clarity. Then they got to go out and communicate the crap out of it. They got to repeat the answers to those questions over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I said it seven times because research shows people have to hear something seven times before they believe it. And most leaders don't like to do that. So you got to over communicate clarity. And finally, you have to put just enough structure in place. Not so much that it bureaucratizes the answers to those questions, but just enough to reinforce it. If you do those four things, the team, the clarity, the communication, the structure, you create what I would say is yeah. a very, what's, what's the right word? It, it's a, it's, a, it's going to survive during difficult times. Yeah, it's, it's very agile, resilient. flexible. Resilient. 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 Right. That's the right word. word. Good yeah. word. Yes. Vocabulary word. And, Thanks, and <laughs> companies that are healthy survive downturns in the market or, or surprises. Unhealthy ones, like in a lot of those Silicon Valley companies, one thing happen, happens in the market and they're gone. People are Which jumping ship. Which is kind of a silly thing to even say, but it, it is true. Health only matters if you want to be around. If, mm. if you're not right. interested in being around as an organization, then don't worry about it. Are you talking about like companies that want to get bought? Sure. Or, I mean, that's a big thing in, in the Bay Area with tech companies is they're not necessarily trying to stick around forever. They just want to grow their value and sell or whatever it is. But if you really want to stick around, you know, same with physical health. If you want to be around, you're going to care about your health. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And even those, but even those companies that want to be around long enough to sell, right. There's a it lot. It still matters. You don't have, what's really surprised me is how many project teams use this stuff. Even though they're like, we're only going to be a project team for six months. But right. They're trying to invest. accelerate all the, the human element of it because normally it takes a good deal of time, or if you don't have a structure around it, it can take some time to build trust, but, but they recognize the value in needing to pour into that side to be successful. Right. So you know what the big question now is, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll prompt myself here. And that's that. Why doesn't, <laughs> why doesn't every CEO right. do this? Right. As we, and this is a great question for, to have Chris here too, because you guys go into executive teams, you present the case for, for, you know, a healthy organization. Why, how do you see leaders responding to that? Or why, why doesn't everyone opt in? Well, most of them initially respond well, but there are some that don't. And, and the first, we, we call it biases. The first bias and the one that drives me the most crazy is what we call the sophistication bias. Yeah. And people will hear us explain this and they'll say, that's pretty simple. And I'm like, it is, I'm not a rocket scientist here. You know, I'm from Bakersfield <laughs> and sorry, Bakersfield, but, and, <laughs> and they'll go, well, if it's not sophisticated, then it must not be right. Hmm. Right. No, 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 no. Simplicity is elegant in itself. Just embrace that's true in all of life. That's right. And they're like, nah, I need something that's more complicated than that, more complex. Right. No, I mean, we, it's physical health. You boil it down, you ask any doctor, yeah. they're going to say, eat right, exercise, sleep. Now you can go to Barnes and Nobles or any bookstore and you're going to find billions of books that are trying to parse or find some creative yeah. way to explain. Basically, you just need to eat better food, exercise more regularly, and try and right. reduce stress and rest in your life. That's not some like sophisticated diet There's hack not, or like a metabolism. And, but it's tempting. I mean, oh, yeah. the health industry mm-hmm. is like full of people who are trying to find this like magic bullet, but it really just boils down to just some simple, simple principles. And some leaders can't accept that they simplicity. They can't accept it. I didn't go to graduate school for the last 22 years to use something really simple. It's like, well, it's going to work. And yet, it's a great when, leader voice, by the way. Thank you very much. That's my leader voice. <laughs> and yet when... Bad leader voice. <laughs> when leaders do, they, when they're sitting around the table and they finally have that team that is just open, they're communicating well, they, they want oh. to be functioning like a team, they're like, I would not trade the conversation we just had around the table for anything. You're not going back. You're never going back. No, it's Once you taste true. it, you cannot go back. No, because it just makes so much more sense. Right. It's just like we're getting, it's like walking in jello and then suddenly not walking that way anymore and getting so much more done and enjoying the process. That's right. So now, sophistication bias, what's the next one? Is the adrenaline bias, I call it. That's that they want something that's going to, 
in, in, in a matter of days, it's going to turn up, they can flip a switch and it's going to, they can implement it and change their business, which we all know there's no such thing. Right. But sometimes they think, well, we could implement a new financial system or a new software system or something else. Give me something now. Mm-hmm. Something it's we like, can put all our energy around. Yeah. It's complete distraction from these simple disciplines. Right. Now, some people will say, so how long does it take to get healthy? Mm-hmm. And the question is, it's actually, you'll start to see the benefits of it in weeks and months. Right. But it never goes away. It never goes mm-hmm. away. You, and, and, and it's fun to continue to stay on top of it. It requires, it's like having a marriage. It's like you can go, to, you can go and do marriage counseling, go on a retreat, go on a, a weekend date. When you get back, you got to stay with it. But even that retreat, after a couple of days, you'll go, this is, I can see the fruits of it now. Right. Yeah. When are you done thinking about the health of your marriage? Never. No. You're the day constantly. you think you're done, right. sign up for some therapy. Exactly. <laughs> and it's the same in, organ, in organizations. The, you should constantly be thinking about the health of your organization. Right. So it's the, the adrenaline bias is the second one. The last one is the quantification bias, Cody. And that's where oh. some leaders think, well, tell me exactly how much this is going to add to my bottom line. What is my market share going to look like if I implement organizational health? How will it, what's the delta going to be? Right. And the truth of the marriage, you cannot measure it. Right. You just can't. I could, I could lie as a consultant and make up a few things and, and say, well, here's the, we're going to add this much to your bottom line. But that's not going to work. It's, it's just, you can't, it, it's, it permeates everything you do in your business. And so there's you, nothing you can put on a Gantt chart no. or you can't graph it. And, I mean, ask Southwest airlines how much value their culture is to their company. They'd say it's everything. Right. I mean, you can't extract it. And yet I'm telling you right now, there's like dozens or p- however many people listening, thinking, no, if you can't measure it, then you can't actually do it in business. It doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist. Right. That's now, not true, though. Yeah, the example I give, together. you get back to marriage, and I, I always right. say, imagine somebody saying, our marriage isn't going so well, and our family's kind of, so we're going to go to marriage counseling. And, and, and they're like, exactly how much is this going to be worth to us financially? Right. And how many <laughs> SAT points is it going to go up for my kids by, by virtue of doing this? Right. How, Nobody would say that. How much has your love quotient increased over the last exactly. six months? Over <laughs> When you talk, and, but yet in, in companies, how many companies are talking about employee engagement like they're trying to measure a love quotient in I their know. marriage? And, and we've got all these metrics and all these things and it boils down to, do people feel genuinely fulfilled coming to work? Well, if you want that, there's some basic things that we have to just put into practice every day. And that, my friend, is a subject for another podcast, employee engagement, something we're very big on. Let's, let's go back to health and talk about, so we know why some certain people don't use it, but, and we talked about how this applies to other businesses. I like talking about how it applies to sports. People like to use sports as analogies. You know, in the sports world, I've worked with some of them. They like to think about business as an analogy. It's interesting. But how many great sports teams succeed because they have a healthier organization? And yet, the broadcasters don't want to talk about that. The people that write about them in the newspaper or magazines don't want to talk about that because they want to say it's this new offense. Right. Or this new player they drafted. Right. And the truth is, it's the culture. The, The New England Patriots, how do they stay so good? Bill Belichick, the coach, creates a culture where the right people fit, the wrong ones don't. Everybody knows what the place is about. That's why they succeed in spite of the fact they don't have as much talent as many of the other teams. And to my friends in New England, I think most of them would agree. Right. Yeah, and the sport, sports is a great arena to talk about this because it has a literal outcome. You know, when we talk about it in the context of businesses, it's like, yeah, you can you can tell in, based on their stock price whether they're successful, but at the end of every game, you're saying, here's how we performed. Did we outperform our competition? And so you're right, so too many examples of teams, you know, that, that focus on talent acquisition, the smart side of things. We're going to get the best quarterback, the best receiver, or the best three-point shooter, you know. Yeah, it's true. You know, the San Francisco 49ers, that's my hometown team here. And years ago when I lived in the city and I was single, we'd go to the games. Now I can't afford to do that. (laughs) But they won all these Super Bowls with Joe Montana and then Steve Young. And people always said, well, it's Bill Walsh and his West Coast offense. Well, it was Bill Walsh because he, but it was, he created a culture. And I knew people that were on the team. I knew the backup quarterback, Jeff Kemp. And I got to know the, uh, we're all good friends with the old chaplain. The the chaplain. Oh yeah. Pat. Yeah, Pat Ritchie. And and they will all tell you, it wasn't the, the smarts of the play calling. That was good. But right. it was, they had a culture where they held each other accountable. That's right. And people said everybody knew what it was like to work in that organization. And they behaviorally, by the way. Exactly. Yeah. Not just, 
what's the what's the game plan of who's going to be where but it was the behavior how are we going to actually show up and play together right and you talk about this a lot where you say you know don't do bad forensic analysis because right. when you when both in terms of winning and losing what right you know oh, i've never heard what, that what is that yeah it's a new thing I, I wrote this article that just came out and it's about people look back especially in the media and they say that company succeeded because of this and that company failed because of this and they never look deeper and go no like once i worked with a company that oh. w- got sold off for a fraction of its worth destroyed a regional economy a lot of people got hurt by it and everybody said they had problems with their product or they made some strategic <laughs> errors right and it's like no the real truth because we saw the sausage making going on was that the ceo had no vulnerability with his team there was no trust nobody ever disagreed nobody ever told each other the truth those other problems were inevitable Right. But they write articles saying it was all, it's like saying Chernobyl was all about the graphite in the nuclear rods or whatever else. Right. The truth of the matter is all these behavioral things led to that becoming the problem. Right. You know, there's another thing I want to talk about sports is my sons all have gone to De La Salle. I have one that's there now and one still to come and two have already gone there. They are (laughs) supposed to be, and they are the best high school football team in the history of high school football. And they won 151 games in a row. They play everybody and they win. And their coach, Bob Latticer, who's t- turned their program around, their kids are smaller. Every, you go to their games and you go, there's no yeah. way these guys are gonna win. They walk right. off the bus and they look, they look like high school students, not like professional athletes. The other you know? teams and their coaches will say that. Mm-hmm. They'll go, oh, we gotta beat these guys. And they win all the time. And people wanna say, they'll, they'll go visit Bob Latticer and say, hey, what's, what offense do you guys run? Right. And you know what he says? It doesn't matter. <laughs> And they go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah. that's not why we win. Well, what, what kind of weight, weightlifting protocol do you have? He goes, that doesn't matter either. Really? They lift weights and they have an offense, but he goes, look at those kids. They're out there working. Nobody's telling them to do it. They're holding each other accountable. They have a brotherhood. Everybody is, is, is doing it as a team. They have a right. culture. And here's the funny thing. If they invented a new offense, the next year, the next week, somebody could replicate it. That's right. But the culture is harder to replicate. See, and yeah. I think that when you think about what is different in a healthy company, it really does boil down to people just want to be together. I mean, you yep. ask anybody, best team you've ever been on, what's that experience? Everybody talks about the camaraderie, the time in the bus, all this time they spend together. And yet every day people check in and out of work like like they're getting there, going to the dentist or something like that. I had a friend, a, a good friend, still a good friend, who worked for years in startups. And Not he- to disparage dentists, by the way. We love our dentists. Your dentist. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> but nobody's loving going there, but I do. I love my dentist, too. In oh, fact, we forgot to do our first we commercial. We forgot to do oh. our first commercial. Well, We're we can't have, call it a commercial, commercial because it's unpaid. You guys have commercials? No. No, we, we have no sponsors. sponsors. <laughs> We're so. just going to promote companies or products that we particularly like. Whether they like it or not. Yes. We're going to do it. <laughs> I hope they do. Cody, tell, give us your first commercial. I feel like we kind of beat this drum a little bit earlier. Nah, but, but it's worth it. I know. I just got back from a trip with my wife. We went on Southwest Airlines and I can't say enough about every time I fly Southwest, like from the person that printed our tickets to people that took our bags. We had our 10 month old with us when we were on the plane, the flight attendant stopped by a dozen times just to say (laughs) hi and make our baby smile. And but before we could even get off, they had put our stroller back together, just made life so easy for us. And and so my first commercial Southwest Airlines and and in the context of what we're talking about, like the health of an organization isn't just about the bottom line and the people that work there. It trickles all the way down to customers, you know, totally. I have, I, I, I don't like flying and they make it so worth my time as such a joyful experience. It's crazy. On the other hand, I just, I went to Europe with my family for the first time I took them to Europe. An anti-commercial. Here we go. An anti-commercial. <laughs> and I flew an airline. We won't say the name, but it rhymes with Shunited. And <laughs> God bless these people <laughs> that work there. And, but, and I thought it was an international flight. So I thought, you know, international is supposed to be better than domestic. It'll be okay. Right. The people serving on them on the flight were just so grumpy. They were unhappy. And all of my kids from age 13 to 21, they all were like, what's going on? And it was just really bad. Right. And so I went to the back of the plane because I love to talk to flight attendants and talk to and kind of commiserate with them or find out what it's like. And I went to the very back of the plane. I stood there and I said, hey, how are things at United, you guys? United. You mean United. Shunite, United. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to edit that out. Yeah. And they go, why? And, and I said, I don't know. How are they? And they go, what do you think? And I said, I don't think they're very good. You guys don't seem happy. <laughs> and they were like, no, it's not good. And they started to tell me about what the problems with how they were managed and how things are going. And I just thought, how long is this going to go on for? It's been mm. years. And what's the difference between them and Southwest? 
you know? And it's not about intellectual decisions and strategy. It's about creating a culture. And so anyway, it's... The- Although a funny story about Southwest, I was standing waiting to board a flight and this guy had come up who had clearly never been on Southwest before asking if he's, if he could upgrade his ticket to first class. And <laughs> I, know yeah, whole- I know what they said. <laughs> okay. The guy, they said the all of our goes, seats are first class. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The lady was like, all our seats are first class. And the guy was like, no, I'm... <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I got a coach ticket. I'd, I'm wondering if I can upgrade. And she was like, no, all, all tickets are first class in Southwest. And I, and they were having this banter he back and forth. And I was meant. like, I was like, lady, just, just tell them we're going to treat you awesome. Every row, but we don't have first class. <laughs> right. They're like, you know, something I've been on first class seats on other airlines and been really bummed out. And I've been on the, in the middle seat on Southwest and thought these people are fantastic. Yeah. And it's, they're healthy. They're healthy. Okay. There you go. Another Our commercial. First. I have a commercial. Oh yeah. There you go. And I'm the only person in this room that could possibly endorse this company. And that is <laughs> Harry's Shave Club. I love Harry's Shave Club. I've never really? met anyone there. Great experience. They make razors that don't cost a, a truckload and they work really well. Is that well. one of those, they ship it to you? They ship it to me. Really? I love it. And, and I don't feel guilty walking out of the drugstore like, oh, I can't show my wife this $50 like once a receipt. Month? <laughs> yeah, once a month. Hmm. And they ask you, how often do you shave? And then they send you that. It's fantastic. Hmm. Now, I realize none of you would ever endorse this company. You'd be mm-hmm. virulently against it. Why? Cody? Well, we have beards, we have but beards. <laughs> I use about one razor a year. So if they have a Which one razor me. per year program, I'm in. Yes. I'm going to sponsor beard oil. It's a wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beard I'm oil in is that. just in general, no particular just in general, brand. No particular yeah. brand. Just, there you go. Especially if you have a particular loved one in your life that you would not like to annoy. Beard oil. Okay, I'm in. Right? I'll have to Very get good. some. You don't do beard oil? Well, I do, I do a wax type. Substance. Okay, enough yeah. about that. Anyway. <laughs> Connor, our but, engineer, what are you going to, what is your uh, product you want to support? Blueberries. Blueberries. <laughs> blueberries. <laughs> Tell us the about why blueberries. blueberries. Are you good? Are you good in smoothies? Smoothies, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. High antioxidants. High antioxidants. S- superfood. The millennials love A them. Superfood. Yeah. Very good. Mm-hmm. We expect the sales of blueberries to skyrocket as a result of this endorsement. <laughs> yeah. We also think Connor might be getting uh, some money under the table from the National Association of Blueberries, the NAB. Right? Well, we certainly, well, this is first of many unsponsored advertisements. Yes. Southwest didn't pay us. They could send some drink coupons our way or first class tickets or whatever they can Or do. some blueberries. Right, or some, some blueberries. blueberries. We'll take any of those. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to kind of wrap this up by talking about what advice we'd give to people. If you're a leader of an organization, small oh, yeah. company, medium-sized company, a department, whatever else, you're a pastor, you're a a school principal, any kind of organization, what we would say is this, do not get locked up in thinking just about the, the smart issues. That's as right. important as they are, if you're, if you're in an organization and you can't answer these questions with an affirmative, then you really got to spend some time on it. Is my team right. really cohesive? Are they really cohesive? And that, I think, really is the most important starting point is for every leader who, or even if you're on a team, to really start thinking is my team cohesive and not, not just intellectually aligned around things, but are we willing to be open and honest with each other? Yeah. Cause if they're not doing it, no one else is doing it. Right. And I, and that, I think even just asking yourself that question, how open and honest are, is my team willing to be with each other? And can they disagree? Yes. Honestly, and be okay with that. And even starting with asking your team at some offsite or whenever you get together, how well, how open and honest are we really? That's a great starting point. Yeah. The second one is, are we truly in agreement around these six critical questions? That's right. You know, and, and all of this is laid out in the advantage and the five dysfunctions of the team. The advantage has all of this in it. And are we really? And because if you're not, go get on the same page. That's right. Because tweaking the dials on the smart side, if you're not on the same page, is just rowing faster and you, in the and wrong you would direction. Be, and these are, you'd be surprised, or I mean, you wouldn't be surprised, but because you wrote the book, <laughs> but... I'm surprised usually when I interact with organizations, why do we exist as an organization? Confusion around that. Yep. Expectations around behavior, confusion or everybody, every leader around the table has a different answer for that. What are we even doing as a business? Are we a product company, a sale service company? What kind of like confusion? How do we define success? Yeah, these are not, not super sophisticated questions. What I find is that most of our clients are actually pretty good at the sophisticated questions they've answered, but the basic ones, they're not on the same mm. page around. Oh, 
the number of CEOs who said, oh, we've got most of those questions already nailed down. And then I just will say, okay, great. We'll just spend five minutes on it. Everybody write down what the answer is. And a team of seven, I'll get 15 different responses. Everyone will say, well, I had two things written down. <laughs> I was going to say, like, okay. That's 2.105. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the third question we'd ha- say is, okay, if, if you're clear and you're aligned, because you got to do that, do people really hear us? And That's do right. they really internalize the message? Do they know what we're about? Do That's you right. communicate it enough? Yeah, I was just telling a team actually last week, I said to the whole team, you know, you've got the, you've got the clarity, but you have to remember you are the chief reminders. You yeah. are the chief communicators. I mean, the, the CEO and the executive team is the CRO, the chief that's reminding right. officer. They have to keep, you have to keep saying it over and over and yep. you don't want to be condescending. People are afraid of being condescending or, or maybe they think it's beneath them, kind of that sophistication yeah. bias thing, but talking and talking and talking about it is so important. Yeah. The best companies we know, the, the, the leaders are not afraid to go up again and again and remind people in creative ways of the same basic principles. That's right. And then the last thing is, is do we have enough structure in our company? If you're a big company, you probably have too much. If That's you're right. a small one, you might not have enough, but you have to have the right amount of structure so it's just enough to reinforce those answers and not so much that it turns it into a bureaucracy. Yeah. So those are the questions. And if, if any of those questions, the answer isn't, yes, we're good on all these, you really have to go back and look at those. That doesn't mean you stop being smart. It just means you're not going to get the benefits that you think you're going to get if you don't address those questions. That's right. Now, what about if you're not a leader? Yeah, I was just going to ask you that because I bet a lot of the listeners here are not necessarily in a position to answer that on behalf of their organization. Do you mean so, like not the CEO leader or just not a leader at well, all? Well, not either. Either. I mean, you're in the organization somewhere. Uh, you or know. You're, you're not the CEO and your team is pretty good, but the CEO's team isn't. People say this. What, what if the problem is above me? Right. And I always say two things. First of all, don't assume that the leader above you is managing or leading the way they want to. Right. Because she or he is probably struggling like you are. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so th- they're not wedded to how they're doing it. They're just surviving. Secondly, is take the risk of being a hero and going to them with humility. Right. And telling them the kind truth to say, hey, listen, I think I have some thoughts about how you might be able to do this better. And I'm not saying I could do your job. Right. I'm not saying I'm, right. I'm perfect. But I thought this might help you, and I just thought I would. It's a risk. They, they need That's some right. truth tellers. Yeah. Exactly. Throughout my career, people would shove me into the CEO's office and say, you tell him. And I would say, why? And they say, because they listen to you. And the reason why is because I wouldn't go in there and be like, you're an idiot. Right. But I would tell them the truth. And it always felt a little risky. And they would go, we want more of this. What else do you got? Well, and even if you're supervising just you know you've got five people that you supervise at work every day and you're not maybe you won't get the attention or you don't have the ear of the ceo or the senior leader those five people every single day are coming in and they're looking at you as the person who's essentially the caretaker of their work experience to a certain extent so even if you don't impact the entire organization or you can't get the attention those five people are just flat worth creating the healthiest environment you possibly can for them. I mean, it just matters that much. Yep. So even a little bit of discipline, practice with humility, don't complain about the rest of the organization and just focus on, let's just do the best we can where we are, makes a big difference. And which reminds me of something, and this organizational health thing is bigger than just the organization. It changes people's lives. It sends them home at night to treat their spouse and their children and strangers and their neighbors better. It really is a movement that we want, we want to support because if, Imagine a day when my kids get out of school and most of the companies they interview with are healthy. Right. That's a different world. Absolutely. And we want to do that. But you know what else we want to do? We want to get out of this podcast fast because we don't want to overstay our welcome. You know those people that come to your house and you're like, oh my gosh, so never leave. We don't want to be that person. So we want to wrap this up. I want to thank Cody, the producer. This has been great. Chris, come down every yeah, week. Thanks for letting from me interrupt Portland. you guys. Thank Connor, our engineer. And we want to thank our listeners for being part of our first podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll hope you join us again. And we just want to end by saying God bless you all. 